All right, guys, we are live. Let me get us a countdown, allow people the time to enter the Holy of Holies uh, Myth Vision podcast, and uh, this will be exciting, so stay tuned. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've been fighting Leviathan a lot lately, and I've I've already defeated the devil in his own territory yesterday. I figure let's just travel to space for a second. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. This is going to be a highly scholarly discussion. I cannot wait to take you guys through the Pentateuch and the development of it. Who wrote it? I mean, do we have any ideas when maybe? I know he doesn't like to talk about dating, but we might get something out of him. I don't know. We'll see. He's he's known for this. And uh, I'm super excited. You guys stay tuned. I'm welcoming on Joel Baden. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, brother. Thanks very much. I say Joel Baden. But Professor Joel Baden, I really do appreciate it. You are highly educated in this uh, research here, and I'm going to go ahead and just straight introduce you. Joel Baden is a professor of Hebrew Bible, director and Center for uh, Continuing Education. Professor Joel Baden works widely in the field of Hebrew Bible with special attention to literary history of the Pentateuch. He is the author, most recently, of the, books, the book of Exodus, which I'm going to get. I'm going to get that a biography uh, that's at Princeton University Press. Uh, his other books include J E and the Redaction of the Pentateuch, the Composition of the Pentateuch, Renewing the Documentary Hypothesis, which is what we're going to talk about today, and that's a Yale University Press. The Promise to the Patriarchs, Oxford University Press. The Historical David, the Real Life of an Invented Hero. <laughs> That'll be exciting. I, I definitely cannot wait to read all this. I can't wait to read all this, honestly. Uh, reconceiving infertility, biblical perspectives on procreation and childlessness, and with Candina Moss, Princeton University Press. I've been trying to get a hold of her as well, but she's always busy. <laughs> um, let's see. The Strata of the Priestly Writings, Contemporary Debate and Future Directions, and uh, let's talk your education here. You have a bachelor's at Yale University, a master's at University of Chicago, and a PhD at Harvard University. Am I missing anything? That's all. Okay. That's it? Is it <laughs> oh, that's all. You know, it's only yeah. a lot of education, a lot of stuff. So he knows uh, quite a bit of things when it comes to this field of research. And today we're discussing his book, The Composition of the Pentateuch, Renewing the Documentary Hypothesis. Notice it's being renewed. It makes me wonder if there's more than one version of this thing. So, Dr. Baden, I appreciate you tuning in. This is super exciting. And I want to give a quick shout out to Digital Hammurabi, our good friend, Dr. Joshua Bowen. He wrote my name on the Lamb's Book of Life and told me that, you know, I was welcome. And you looked at that list and you said, okay, okay, his name's on the list. I'll, I'll come on the show. So I, I thank you, Dr. Josh. You are the man. Uh, I owe you big time, brother. So thank you so much for making this possible. So Dr. Baden, Moses wrote the first five books. That's like, that's well known, right? Yeah. And so I think we're done here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the you know that's the traditional claim. Um, it goes back a, a long time, though not as far back as people think. Um, you know, I think everybody uh, everybody's you know raised in traditional background is taught with Jewish or Christian, right? Like that's the the standard thing, right? That the books of the five books of Moses. Um, uh, but you know, there's uh, there's reasons to think that that's not the case, um, aside from the fact that. As it turns out, the right the Torah, the Pentateuch itself, never makes that claim. And of course, actually, like virtually no biblical books make claims actually about who wrote them. Uh, even you know, aside from maybe the the prophets, they get like names attached to them, right? This is what Jeremiah said. Okay, that's different. Um, but uh, you know, Moses is uh, is a character 
in the in the Pentateuch. He's not the he's not the author of it. Uh, and despite the sort of uh, the longstanding claims that uh, uh, that Moses was was the author, I, like you know that as an idea, it was has been challenged for 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 a long time in various ways, right? So that you know in the um, even in the medieval period, Jewish uh, Jewish thinkers were like, "You're telling me he wrote the lines about his that he wrote, he wrote about his own death and burial?" Like, no, nah, maybe not. Uh, or you know, there are some like little chronological things. The famous one, um, uh, famous one at the very beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, which is like Moses's like moment to shine, right? That, like that's his big speech. And the very first things it says in the book is like, "This is this is what Moses said on the other side of the Jordan." Uh, and yeah, you know, again, in the medieval period, people were like the other side of the Jordan. Like you only call it the other side if you're on like the Canaan side. Right? How? Do, why would Moses say the other side of the Jordan if he was the? And you know, there's little things like that. Uh, you know, I will say, you know, certainly by the 17th century, uh, certainly in the 18th century, uh, people were like, no, like this, this doesn't work. Moses, Moses can't have actually written this. I'll tell you, my, uh, I love this. My favorite. My favorite argument for why Moses probably didn't write it, it's like a, it's like a side thing, but there's a, there's a line in the book of Numbers uh, where it says, now Moses was the most humble man on earth. <laughs> and like the logic of the most humble man on earth writing that he's the most humble man on earth, like even like, yeah, even some like pretty devout, uh, devout critics were like, that doesn't feel right. Uh, so, you know, mosaic authorship, like, whether it was one person or many, the idea that it was Moses who wrote it, uh, basically fallen out. Yeah, we're like 400 years into nobody uh, into that not being like a accepted scholarly position anymore. When do um, you think someone? And, and this is interesting. I just kind of like want to press in whenever you get into something. I'll throw an idea out there. Of course, if someone wants to super chat a question, feel free. We won't wait till the end. We'll try to incorporate your question during this broadcast, but. Uh, when do you think people started saying Moses wrote the five? Do you have a general idea of when you think? I know you don't have like a date on June yeah, yeah. 14th, you know, like. Uh, it was over breakfast one Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, no, the. Um, so it, it's interesting, right? We we sort of think that that's like an eternal idea, like that it's always been attributed to Moses. But as far as I can tell, and again, I'm not, I can't, as you said, I can't give like a specific date. But as far as I can tell. Um, what happened was essentially like uh, a couple of like pieces of like like nomenclature changed. So like people, even in the Bible, it's already called the right the scroll of the Torah of Moses. Um, there's already reference to it, but that doesn't mean that it's written by Moses, right? That just means it's like it's the the in, in the same way that the book of Ruth wasn't written by Ruth, right? Like um, so to call it the scroll of Moses actually doesn't necessarily mean he wrote it, but you can understand how somebody would make that, make that leap. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that contributed in part to it. It's just like calling it that. Uh, and also the, the, the word Torah actually uh, also changed its meaning over time. Right? originally Torah was like, just, just meant like a law or a practice, right? Like, so even within the Bible, we have references to like, uh, like the Torah of the burnt offering in in the middle in, in like the first part of Leviticus, right? And then there's like you know the paragraph about like how how you do the burnt offering, right? And that's called the the Torah. Right? It's like the individual law of the burnt offering. And then like Torah gets ex gets expanded to mean like a whole set of laws. So uh, the book of Deuteronomy refers to like its own laws as Torah, but like not the whole thing, not the story, just like just the law part. And then eventually, so like it keeps on growing until the word Torah encompassed everything from Genesis through mm. uh, through Deuteronomy. At which point, right, like it was one thing to say Moses is responsible for the Torah in Deuteronomy, like he speaks it, right? That's reasonable. But once Moses, you know, once so in Deuteronomy it says, Deuteronomy thirty one nine, uh, it says, you know, Moses wrote down this Torah, and what it means in that context is Moses wrote down the laws of Deuteronomy that he just said. But once the word Torah had expanded to mean the whole thing, now when people read Moses wrote down this Torah, they were like, oh, Moses wrote the Torah, right? And that that line becomes like the, the crux. But, uh, you know, again, it, 
like when we figure out like how the word Torah changed in meaning, we can sort of let go of that of that claim. Um, it's not unlike um, you know, it's it's not unlike the way that uh, other biblical figures get attached to kinds of writings that like they didn't actually write, but now bear their names. This may be a different show, but like David didn't write the Psalms, but we call this, but like everyone refers to the Psalms as like the Psalms of David. Uh, Solomon, uh, you know, didn't write Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but like even in the Bible, it says he did. Like somebody mm -hmm. like said, like these are the Proverbs of Solomon. But again, the Proverbs of Solomon doesn't, even that doesn't mean Solomon wrote them. It just means like we're affiliating his name with, in any case, uh, right. Moses' authorship, long-standing thing going going pretty far back you know the early um the new testament refers to the the torah as the books of moses and uh early jewish interpreters uh were very clear right moses wrote the entire torah though even they were like but maybe not the last verses where he dies <laughs> that development took up later in your book so for those who have not uh, read it you need to see the composition of the pentateuch renewing the documentary hypothesis by Dr. Baden. Now I know it's a little pricey. If you can afford it, it's really worth it. I've got it down in my recommended books in the link in the description on the Amazon affiliate link. Gives me a slight kick if you guys buy something. But uh, really, you need to see this because you build up in this. You build up this really cool case and talk about the rabbis and you say, well, you know, they they even started one of them. I mean, you name them by name. I can't remember their names, but uh, and he's like, uh, there's something that doesn't quite you know add up. And then another rabbi jumps like, goes, you know, you're right, you're right. All of this is by him except this and this. And it sounds like there's this same harmonization tool Christians use of this book interprets this book, Bible interprets a Bible kind of concepts. And you point out quite often in this book, a lot of contradictions. You give a great first story example of Joseph. And I guess it'd be the good time to go into the slavery of Joseph who um who took him to Egypt? Who bought him? What Amalekites or were these the uh the Ishmaelites? I mean, what what's going on here? Yeah, uh yeah, I, I started the book there in part because it's like uh it's a reasonably well-known story, and you know, partly because there's a whole musical about it. Um, but like uh it's just it, you know, it's one example out of many. You know, the issue when you, you pick up the beginning of the story of Joseph, and you know, I think most people who are reasonably familiar with the Bible well, we can tell you the basic story, right? Like Joseph pissed off his brothers and they decided to kill him. And they were like, hold on, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him and get rid of him that way. And so they sell, so like they sell him and they take his, you know, his like special fancy coat thing. <laughs> and they like, uh, and they put the blood on it and they show it to, to Jacob, his father. And Jacob therefore thinks that he's been killed by a beast, but we know he's actually just like down in Egypt where the story is then going to take place for a while until like, the brothers come back to him. Um, so like, as with most biblical stories, if you ask someone to just sort of tell it to you, they tell it to you like that, right? Like a perfectly straightforward story. Yeah. I always read it that way. I never even, I, I didn't have the tools. You, nobody said Ishmaelites, Amalekites. What yeah. the heck it's not, is the thing is, it's not, it's not even about having the tools. It's about being trained to read in such a way that our eyes gloss over problems because we're told, right? Like, it's not even we were told, right? When you pick up a story, you like expect it to work and to make sense and to not be problematic. And so like we like instinctively fix problems when we read. And so it takes, um, it's not even like, it's not even about having special, like special advanced skills. It's just about reading it like super carefully without thinking in, ahead of time, oh, this must make sense, right? Um, we expect it to make sense, right? We should pick up every text and expect it to make sense, but we should also be like ready for it not to. So in this case, right? Uh, in this case, the, the crucial moment happens like at the, the climax of the story when Joseph's brothers take him and they throw him into a pit and then they sit down to eat a meal uh, because they're like, you know, a bunch of callous dudes who just like killed off their brother and then like sat down for for lunch. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, and then like they look up and they see uh, and they see a caravan of Ishmaelites uh, passing by on their way to Egypt. And that's when Judah is like, oh, hold on. Uh, why are we going to kill him? Like we can make some cash here. 
let's, you know, and also like not have blood on our hands, let's just sell them to these passing Ishmaelites, which all is perfectly good and makes sense in our story. And then there's this moment when it suddenly says, and then some Midianite traders passed by and pulled Joseph out of the pit. Now, Ishmaelites and Midianites may all be foreign to us, but they're not the same people, right? Um, so suddenly we're like, there's two caravans of people coming through and and the plan was to sell him to the Ishmaelites, but the Midianites take him out of the pit they've put him in. And then it says, and this is the, the most confusing part, this says, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. So who sold him to the Ishmaelites? The brother's plan was to sell him to the Ishmaelites. The Midianites just pulled him out of the pit. Did the Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelites? Like maybe in that case, the brothers didn't get anything out of it at all. Uh, like, did they even know what had happened? I don't know. <laughs> um, and then, but then like the story goes on as if nothing were weird. Um, and they like take the coat and they do the thing. And then at the end of the chapter, it tells us that the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt, which doesn't make any sense because someone sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites earlier, right? Was it the brothers or was it the Midianites? Whoever it was, it should have been the Ishmaelites who brought him to Egypt. And in fact, it even says earlier on, and they brought him to Egypt. And then suddenly the Midianites are the ones who are selling him Egypt. So like how, like just on the, level of like trying to figure just plot right just who is doing what and when and where and how and why like just basic like story stuff you like think about like how could you how would you film it right like it's a story <laughs> thing, right you should be able you should be able to imagine you could be able to picture it happening right like how where is anybody are the brothers ishmaelites midianites and joseph like reading the story as it is in the biblical text you actually can't it, it doesn't make sense, right? You you can't make it work, hmm. um, and like it's it's not. It's honestly the whole thing isn't trickier than that. Like it's 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 not more complicated than like it doesn't work. Like the, as on the basic level of story, it it just doesn't work. And so, you know, uh, it becomes an issue of like, okay, well, like there's a contradiction, right? Ishmaelites here and Midianites here, and like. Well, what parts of the story involve the Midianites? Like, if the two things can't go together, then like, what has to connect with what? And you know, if you sort of just like follow, like, set your contradictions like in in two columns, as it were. Like, this can't go with this, and then you're like, well, but this part has to go with this other part of the story, right? Like, the Midianites stealing him from the pit or taking him out of the pit has to go with the Midianites selling him at the end of the story, right? And the Ishmaelites, uh, you know, all the Ishmaelite stuff has to go with Judah being like, let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. Like, so you just like put the things together and this like miraculous thing happens. And like, it's, it, and like, it's replicable, right? Anybody can kind of do this, right? It helps to have somebody guiding you, but like anybody can do this, right? You just, you take the parts that don't agree and you take the parts that do agree. And like, you do a little horizontal separation and a little vertical continuity stuff. And you end up in, even in this chapter that like doesn't seem super uh, like that we, like we know relatively well, um, you end up with not one messed up story, but you end up with like two comprehensive stories that make pretty, sense pretty, somewhat. Pretty reasonable stories that like each individually are telling how Joseph got to Egypt, but they, and like they agree on stuff, right? Everyone knows, right? Joseph's brothers uh, like tried to off him. But they failed and he ended up in, in Egypt. But, you know, how did he end up in Egypt? Who took him there? Which brother was like, was the one who, you know, because at one point Reuben tries to save him. At another point, Judah tries to like not kill him. Anyway, it all, it all ends up uh, working out really nicely. And, um, you know, I open with that story because it's like reasonably short. Uh, the place where scholars figured this out first was, I think, like probably the most famous of these, which is the flood story. Um, right. In Again, in like the you know, 17th, 18th century, um, the part of the story that scholars were like, this just doesn't work <laughs> as a story. But it, it, it wasn't, they weren't like, let's, let's look at the story of Joseph. They were like, let's look at the most, like one of the most famous stories in the entire thing where the contradictions are actually like far more blatant in a sense, even though the Ishmaelite Midianite thing is like pretty in your face. Yeah. Like, the flood story, which I don't do in the book, in part because it's so famous, and in part because it's just so long, it would take like you know it's three chapters long, and all the all the other ones I look at are like one chapter because you know one only has so much time. Um, but you know the flood story is another one. It's like the flood story is one that 
everybody, everybody you stop on the street could tell you the flood story, probably like to, to some extent, you know, uh, God said to Noah, uh, you know, everybody sucks. I'm going to destroy everything. Um, you know, so I'm going to bring a flood. So get, you know, like do the, build an ark, and get in it. And how many animals is everybody like you do this, right? Like I'll, I'll play with you, right? Uh, how many animals is God tell Noah to take on the ark? Derek, go ahead. Uh, how many a pair, a pair talks about in pairs. Right. Like a two. right. Yeah. Pair, a pair of every animal there is, right? Right. Male and female, right? Why? Because like after the flood, you need them to reproduce. Okay. So uh, you take a pair of every animal and then, um, and then like, uh, we all know how long did the flood last? Like famously? Uh, four, uh, 40 days. That's it. Yeah. 40, 40 days. 40 days. Right. Now, the flood lasts for 40 days. And, um, and when, uh, and when, and when Noah sends out, like Noah sends out the bird, right? Like famously, what kind of bird is it? Uh, I think it's a dove or. A dove. Yeah. Right. Right. Noah sends out a dove. Three. And it, <laughs> right. You're doing really well. And at the, at the end, and right, like everything dies. And then Ark comes to rest on the mountain and he sends out the dove and all the things. And he, and he gets out. And then God says, I promise never to do it again. And the sign of my promise is. Uh, never to let it rain again or flood again, if you will. Right. And, and, and so, and so what does God rainbow. create in order? Rainbow, right? And that's, the, and that's where we get rainbows from. And that's the story. We're like, and everybody can tell you and you can tell, and everyone can tell you that story. And most people could sing you the damn song, right? Like Noah, he built him, he built him and Arky, Arky, right? Like, um, uh, right. This like silly kid song that like tells the story. Everyone can tell you that story and everyone has it with the same details, right? Uh, 40 days and 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And, uh, and he sends out a dove and like, and two of every animal. And if you read the text of the, of Genesis, you're not going to find that stuff. Like it's there. You'll find that stuff, but you'll also find other stuff, right? Like right. in Genesis, it also lasts 150 days. Mm. And he also takes on seven pairs of like, clean, clean animals and birds, right? Clean means sacrificable. Uh, and he also sends out a raven. And like, you couldn't, like just on chronology alone, you can't make it work, right? To how long does right. it last? 40 days or 150 days? I don't know, like the Bible says both. And like, there's a whole calendar and you can't like, it doesn't, it just, does, it doesn't work. You cannot tell the story. You couldn't film it, right? Like you, you can't, right. it, it's not, uh, it's simply not a coherent story. And the flood story, and we just did like, you know, there's a dove and there's raven. There's 40 days, 150 days. There's uh, two of every animal and there's seven pairs of, the, of all the clean animals, right? Again, it falls into two contradictory columns, right? Where they're contradictory to each other, right. but they're all totally consistent this way. And you get two perfectly good flood stories. In that, one. Right, not one messed up one. Right. I, I just, I just wanted to let you know, Flip. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. He's bringing us back to Moses for a second. I don't know if you could see this. I have to ask: Is Moses a composite character? Does he fo uh, follow pre-existing literary elements, kind of how Moses brought the word down from God, and Jesus was the word logos from Yahweh? Uh, that jumps to the New Testament a lot, but, um, but yeah, what, is he a composite character? Most scholars think he didn't exist now, and it used to be a consensus that he did. Do you think yeah. he exists? Uh, Exist <laughs> is almost, it's almost the wrong category. Like, uh, so the question is this, right? Like, let's do it this way. Are the stories about Moses in the Bible historically accurate and true? And the answer is no. Um, is Moses in the Bible a literary character? Yes, right? He's a character in a book. Um, and like, if that's a really useful thing to remember is what we're doing is we're reading a book. Mm -hmm. um, and Moses is a character in it. And whether... Like in a sense, whether there's a historical origin there or not is kind of irrelevant to the question of like his character. Um, in the same way that, you know, I could write a historical fiction about whomever and like the person exists, but my story's not true. Um, so I don't know whether there was actually a dude named Moses at some point. Like I kind of suspect that there was in part because like, un again, not saying that the stories about him in the Bible are true, but was there a, someone named Moses who probably did something like leave Egypt, maybe with some people with him? Uh, yes, that's possible. Uh, in, in fact, I'd even say it's almost probable, if only because uh, if you were totally, totally inventing like the hero of your like early national history, right? Like um, you probably would give him not uh, like like a name that was not that one. Right, Moses is an is an Egyptian name, um, 
And if you were like inventing completely uh, like your hero, you'd probably give him some sort of good Israelite name, right? Because he's an Israelite after all, like in the story. Um, so again, there's, there's a, a few things like that that make me suspect that there probably was someone named Moses at some point in history, but that means it says nothing about whether the stories about him in the Bible are true. One of the reasons, and this goes to the, actually the question that was asked about being literally composite, um, one of the reasons that we can't say the stories in, about Moses in the Bible are true is for the exact same reason that we can't say how the flood exactly happened, right? Because there's not one consistent story of Moses. Right? What there are, are multiple stories of Moses, right? From the different right, authors of the text. And right, like if one of them is true, then the other one isn't, right? And the composite story like suffers from all these same kinds of uh, narrative problems. And like, you know, it's a, Moses is so broad, right? Covers four books of the of the five. That I, you know, you can't you can't like point right. to any, you can't point to like the moment where it breaks down or anything. It's just like the whole thing doesn't quite work. Except you know, we can point out some things like uh, like twice God tells Moses like, "Hey, this is my name. You can call me this now." Um, like you, you, Moses could have been the second time. Moses could have been like, "Check." Like heard that one already. Um, yeah. And, and then like on a, on a more like uh, limited level, if you were to go try and, if you try and read, right, like the core chapters of, uh, of Exodus, right, with the, the whole event on Sinai, right, where Moses is constantly going up and down the mountain, right, you might notice that there are some moments when Moses goes up the mountain and then God is like, okay, come up the mountain. And then Moses is like suddenly back down at the bottom of the mountain again, or like he's at the bottom of the mountain and then it's like, and he went back down the mountain. Right? Like there's, again, there's these like narrative plot problems that signal that, uh, that the story is, uh, is composite in all these ways. Interesting. Uh, last thing on that topic. And I, I do want to mention this, uh, Jim majors, man. What's up, brother. He's in the chat. He's myth vision, uh, professor Baden being as there were clearly no winners in the Genesis flood accounts. Is it safe to say the rainbow given by God was a precipitation trophy? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to respond to, to jokes? Hi, Jim. Uh, uh, I interact with Jim sometimes on the Twitters. Um, uh, that's a pretty good one. Uh, right. That's all right. Yeah. So um, as far as Moses being a pre, he, he asked also like pre-existent literary uh, composite figure. You know how a lot of people will say, well, you know, Noah looks a lot alike uh, in the Enuma Elish. You know, you could look at characters and other of these stories. Do you know any stories that Moses particularly uh, mimics or has similarities to that pre or we would say are older? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the most famous is Moses's birth story. Right. The story, you know, the whole thing like uh, he, you know, he has to be hidden and he gets put in a little like uh, basket or whatever in the and put in the river and gets found. Uh, that story is like a thousand years earlier than the biblical text. At least I don't have the numbers right in front of me. That's the, that's what, um, that's the birth legend of the uh, Assyrian uh, King Sargon. Uh, okay. From like, I think from like the third millennium BCE. Um, and like, you know, and it, in Sargon's case, he's found by a goddess, I'm pretty sure. But like the same, it's, it's, it's this, it's clearly the same story, right? So it's, this is a case where the people or the person in this case writing that particular like Moses story, um, that story of his of his birth and being hidden and all of that is clearly drawing on um, a probably relatively well known, like much older Mesopotamian tradition and like and taking taking up right like that kind of birth story. Right. Like that's the birth story of this legendary king from Mesopotamia. So like, that's a good story for us to use for our legendary, like not King, but like lawgiver, right? It signals his importance by virtue of its participation in like this sort of well-known, like, you know, literary trope. Interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer that. And uh, moving forward, I'm taking super chats. If you guys want to has, uh, have questions. Um, so going into some issues of other contradictions you mentioned, who's Moses's dad. I, I actually did a live the other day with Dr. Uh, Robert Price, where I mentioned, you know, these contradictions reading out of your book a little. And I said, look, uh, we don't know who Moses's dad was or what mountain, uh, like which mountain is this Morab or Horab, or is this Mount Sinai? Like what is the name of Moses's dad and all these different things. Can you mention some of those as well as 
I think doublets play into the narratives that you were already kind of talking about, like doublet type narratives, but sometimes they're really small and sometimes really big. Can you give yeah. us some examples of this? And then maybe it'll segue us into, um, you know, why there's source material. We can start talking about the documentary hypothesis as we segue. Right. In. Yeah. So again, like we're all trained by our traditions to like ignore stuff. Right, like to just read read past it, gloss over it, or explain it away somehow. Yeah. Uh, but like once you start ignoring stuff and glossing over stuff and explaining stuff away, you're acknowledging that there's stuff to ignore or gloss over or explain away, right? Like we need to remember that every time someone's like, no, no, that's not a problem. It's I just explain it this way. What they're actually doing is acknowledging that there's something that requires explanation and isn't just like straightforward and, and nice. Um, so you know, the Pentateuch is like it's full. It's it's full of contradictions and, as you say, uh, doublets and and all kinds of, of other problems. Um, I did the flood uh, in like incredibly yeah. briefly just now. Uh, you know, creation, like uh, creation, 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 much, creation's kind of the big one, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and this and this is and, and it's great. It's another one where like you could ask anybody, like, how did creation go in the Bible? And they're like, oh, that's easy, right? Like uh, seven days, right? Like first there's, you know, first there's nothing. And then God makes the things and says that that sounds good. And it's like day one, two, three, four, five, six. And on day seven, he rested. And then uh, Adam and Eve, and then like the Garden of Eden. And like, they just, you know, you just say it like, like that. <laughs> but, but like, the two things don't go together, right? Like the seven day creation story in Genesis one, like, you you can't fit the other one into it except by explaining it like in some sort of uh, convoluted manner. Right? The Garden of Eden and and the seven days of creation like they're just totally at odds with each other. Um, so that's like doublet and contradiction. Um, uh, God, like it's it's it, it, there's a million of them. Uh, so you're, right, you right, picked on some of the laws you, too. You picked on some of the yeah and laws too. But you picked on some of the names, right? Like Moses's father-in-law has two names. Um, the mountain where God appears and gives the laws has two names um there you know there's this thing called the tent of meeting um that uh is described twice um once in exodus and once in uh in uh sort of you know leviticus numbers and um in in and in, in the two cases it's built differently it's in a different place it has a different function uh, so that's a doublet and a contradiction there's I mean, there's easy doublets, right? How many times does Moses get water out of a rock with his uh, with his staff, right? That happens twice in the in the Bible, even though like when like I don't know, like he did it once, and then and then and, and, and then they got thirsty again, and he was like, I know how to fix it anyway. He did, it and he does it again. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's it's 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 almost it's not that it's, it's infinite, but there's a lot of it. Um, again, yeah. some of them are really small, like the name of a person. Who cares? Some of them are like a little bigger. When and where did Aaron die? Right, it says one thing in Numbers and a different thing in Deuteronomy. Um, uh, and then, right, how did Moses get to Egypt? Um, when did God reveal His name to? Uh, when did people start worshiping uh, Israel's God by His proper name? Right, in Genesis, in, in, in you know, in Genesis they start doing it right away. In Exodus they start doing it. In in uh, we we learn God's name in Exodus three, and then again in Exodus six. Um, uh, you know, what is it that, uh, that Moses t gets on the mountain? Does he get laws? Does he get a blueprint for a tabernacle? Um, how long, you know, does he tell them the laws right then? Does he save it for later? And as you said, within the laws themselves, there's actually plenty of contradictions also, right? Uh, in Exodus, we learn, you know, wherever you want to build an altar and worship me, go for it, man. Like that's what God says right at the beginning of those laws. And then in Deuteronomy, it's like, there's only one place where you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> or um, no other prophet. Uh, and then, yes, there will be more prophets. I, I want to say something, though. There's almost 200 people watching right now, right? And I, I'm kind of irritated, right? Because there's only 69 likes, Joel. There's only 69 likes. I, I don't know why. I'm, I'm very dislikable is the thing. So you <sighs> have a that like. button. There's probably more of those. <laughs> I got one, and I suspect just my opinion is either Christian or someone is a conservative Jew. I think, I think it's probably digital Hammurabi. I saw those guys pop up. No, oh, that's what it is. That's I know it's you hit that like button. Everybody we're going into some crazy stuff. Uh, I'm really excited because when you read his book, I mean, it's, it's over my head. I must admit it's it, it a lot of the J E D P material. Like in my head, I'm like, what genius figured this out to know what is a J and what is a an E and what is a D 
that, that's what I'm saying. So like, you got to read it. It just blew my mind how you guys were able to do that. And um, another thing, we got a super chat. Can I ask this question? Is Abram from Ur in the E source, Genesis 15, 7, or is that a later insertion based on P? Genesis 15 starts with after this. Are we missing E's opening? Okay, so that is like a high level question, man. Uh, that's a super <laughs> high level question. So um, I'll answer that. And then like, it's probably worth backing up to be like, okay, Heller, J, E, P, and D, right? You've said it a couple of times. I've said it. This question is totally based on it. And like, I realize it's easy to like talk about all the contradictions and stuff and not actually get into like the meat of the thing. The development. Like, what, and like, what's, the, what's the theory, right? Okay. Right. So, um, so Ben's question is a good one, right? Like in, in one place, it says that Abraham comes from, uh, comes from Ur of the Chaldeans. And then in another place that we think is from a different author, it says the same thing. Um, and so the, uh, that's a pretty good one, John. <laughs> I got to tell I, you. That was like, good, dude. I caught you. I, have, I, have, I got no problem with that. That's like, at some, at some point, like I could really grow, I could really go for it if I wanted to, but like, okay. Anyway. Um, right. Uh, welcome to Between Two Ferns. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, the issue is this, like the, um, it's, it's, it depends question. It's one or the other, probably. Um, I think that uh, my suspicion is that it's the one in, um, in earlier in the in what we call P that is the that is the insertion based on 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 this one in Genesis 15, but I don't know that for sure. And I do think we're missing probably the beginning of the of the E source, but I don't know that we um, I don't know how much. Uh, okay, that was my answer to Ben, and now I have to explain to everybody else what the hell did I just say? Um, <laughs> like what was what was that? So here's so like okay. Let's back up for a second, like to our when I was talking about the flood story, right? One flood story that that doesn't work, we can separate really nicely into two perfectly good flood stories. Okay, um, and you could just stop there and be like, oh, so there like just happened to be two flood stories, and somehow they 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 got together like this. But I also mentioned the two creation stories, right? And it turns out one of the flood stories, like directly, is related to one of the creation stories, and the other flood story is related to the other creation story. In other words. Like they're literally connected, right? Cross references and, and all kinds of stuff. So what that suggests is we're not looking at just like random bits of stuff, but like actually longer compositions, right? Uh, something that began with Genesis one and continued on and eventually hit its its version of the flood story. And then you can you can just keep going, right? Um, you keep going. You see the as you keep reading, right? What are the parts of the text as we read that agree with the narrative claims and presuppositions of that Genesis one flood story, like trajectory. Right. Um, and, 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 and so on and so on for the next. So like, it's actually, you know, Derek, you're like, I don't know how to do this. Like you could do it. Um, like it's, it's not, it's not like uh, outside the realm of like normal reading. Like there's no trick here. It's just reading, right. It doesn't require, it helps to have the Hebrew, but like, it doesn't require some sort of like, advanced like degree in physics or something, right? If you simply stop and read slowly, so you like, um, you know, in any case you come to, uh, you, you're reading along and, you, and you're like, oh, well, if it says this, right? If it's telling me like, and Abraham left whatever town, then like, it's probably related to the story earlier where he got to that town, right? Um, that's just, you know, simple kind of like reading continuity stuff. Or, you know, if to go back to the creation and flood stuff, right? If Genesis 1 says, uh, you know, part of creation was separating the waters above and the waters below, right? These like mythic primordial waters that are above and below the earth. And then in the flood story, one flood story, at one point it says, and it rained for 40 days. And the other one says, God opened the floodgates from above and below. Okay, like the, the, the one that says floodgates from above and below clearly is like referring to the cosmic uh, vision of, of Genesis one. So that kind of continuity, again, I'm, uh, I'll give another quick example. To give a basics <laughs> to explain that though, even in the dumber terms, what you're pretty much saying is that's how we can tell that the same source materials being used and that the flood in Genesis six and seven 
if you will, is actually referring to Genesis one. They actually connect. So it's yeah, almost yeah. like a narrative retelling the Genesis one account. I mean, it, right. It is. I mean, it isn't. And in the case of the flood, right? Like the opening of the cosmic waters above and below in the flood story is like clearly, okay, God is like uncre like undoing the creation of Genesis one. So like, it's not just words, right? It's concepts and it's, it's, it's story. And another like really quick um, example, again, from something I mentioned, I, I, I talked about there's two tents of meeting, right? There's one in so the center of the camp um, and there's one outside the camp. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other material in the, in the Pentateuch where the Israelites all go to the center of the camp to the tent of meeting, or Moses goes out of the camp to the tent of meeting out there. Like it's <laughs> not rocket science. It's like, okay, so like, a bunch of stories are connected by virtue of where they think the tent of meeting is. And another bunch of stories are connected by virtue of where they think the tent of meeting is. And like, they don't all work together, right? Like, uh, but you know, again, you, like you separate the things and then you then you do the, the columns. If you do this over the course of the entirety of the, of the Pentateuch, uh, you end up actually not with two different, um, like not with the two narratives as we have in the creation flood, but like a third one comes in, in Genesis 15, um, I, I think. Uh, a third one comes in that like, how do I know there's a third one suddenly shows up? Because it's telling me stuff that doesn't agree with either of the two that I've already identified. And then it continues with its own stuff that like, and, and you know, you're just following it through and you, you go on and you get these three sort of interweaving with each other uh, as you read all the way through Genesis through Numbers. And then suddenly you get to Deuteronomy and like, it's got a whole bunch of different stuff to say, right? <laughs> uh, and you're like, oh, I'm reading, like, I'm reading something uh, different again. And by, and so, and, and that's, and that's it, right? And by right. the end, there's four, right? There's basically four like narratives um, that, that we can, we can pull out of the text and see that they are, like the text, the text that we have, the canonical Pentateuch is problematic, right? It's hard to read in all the ways I've described, both on like the individual like story level and on like the broader narrative level. It's like the four gospels. It's like trying to say the four gospels are perfectly lined up, put them side by side and you're going to see, hold on, how many women went to the Tim? Wait, hold on. He went outside in Gal Galilee. What, where, you know, like. Oh, right. So the, the, the right. It, it's, it's a good analogy because it like, it's the it's the analogy to the situation beforehand, right? Um, if, imagine if you took the Gospels and you were like, "This isn't four different takes on the same story. This is just one story." And you were like, "And I'm going to smush them all together," right? You would end up with in in your text, you'd end up with like some contradictions, right? Um, right? How many people were where? Right? You're going to know these better than I am. But like when when the Gospels don't agree on a thing. Um, if you were to try and combine them into one story, you would have disagreements in yeah. your story and you wouldn't know which one was true, right? Um, so what we have in the Pentateuch is the combination, but by following all the things that agree and disagree with each other, you end up with uh, with, four, with four source texts, four documents that like agree internally with themselves that are pretty much continuous. I, you know, I use the words like continuous and coherent um, and like, um, and and that uh, and what and the coolest part is, actually not unlike the Gospels, but right? you can see the way from the way that each one of them told the story. Like, what are the things that they cared about, right? What did how did they think things worked? Um, what did, how did they understand God God's I, you know existence, God's relationship with humanity, with Israel? Um, it's not the same, right? They didn't all think the same thing in the same way that the Gospel writers didn't all think the same thing, right? Like. Um, mm. uh, <laughs> it's pretty useful. I just had to pop this up because Dr. Bowen made this possible. So you can't, I can't leave my boy hanging. And of course he thinks you're the best guest ever. And look, I, I watched your interview with him and I don't know if I could even compete. That's how good he interviewed you. So would you mention the legal well, issues? Maybe have some you ever of the, seen, have you ever, and have you ever seen Megan interview someone? She's dude. There's nobody like her. Nobody. <laughs> she's so chill too. Seriously. <laughs> She's just so chill. I've interviewed her one time and uh, she was a little nervous, I think. But anyway, side yeah. we're sidetracking here. But uh, s can you discuss a little bit of a uh, legal section? Yeah. So <laughs> so the thing the thing to, re to remember, uh, we, we sort of instinctively, and Christianity is a little bit responsible for this, uh, we separate the law from the narrative, right? We think like 
in part because Christianity was like law schma, right? Um, so like uh, legal schmiegel would have been funnier. Anyway, um, uh, so like when we separate the law from the narrative, we get this like false sense of like other oh, story and like that's, you know, all this interesting stuff is going on. And then there's like these big chunks of law in there and like they're doing their own thing. What you have to remember is every one of the laws the big, you know, the laws all come in the in the Pentateuch in big chunks, right? There's a big chunk in the in Exodus 21, 23. There's the big chunk of Leviticus in the first half of Numbers, and there's the big chunk of Deuteronomy. Um, and none of those are just like like you're you're reading along and suddenly there's law code, right? Like they're right. all part of stories, right? When right, they're all right, God told Moses the laws, and Moses told the laws to the people, right? Like where in the wilderness, at the mountain, or 40 years later, or wherever it was, but like. The laws are part of the stories. So in fact, the idea that um, like Moses, uh, like when and where Moses gave the laws and what laws they were is actually part of the contradictions of the of the text. So that when we talking earlier about like uh, the contradictions between various parts of the laws, you know, how long are you allowed to keep a slave? And, um, uh, you know, how are you supposed to observe the Passover? There's all sorts of them, like when and where and how the festivals all work. Could uh, we know. include marrying foreigners or at least involving the whole Gentile theme, the others into this? Comp like, is like, one side somewhat saying don't do it and the other side's like, look, uh, there's some flexibility? Uh, nah, actually, like I would, I think my feeling is, I think most of them were like, don't do it. It, it depends on your definition of foreigner, right? Like there's definitely okay. like the, the people who live in Canaan when the Israelites get there, no one thinks they should be marrying. Right. right? Um, others, like maybe it's like, it's actually, it's much later in the Bible, right? It's in the books of Ezra, who's like, never, no one ever. Um, right, right. But, you know, so it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little different in the Pentagon. In any case, um, you've got these law codes embedded in narratives and the laws disagree with each other. And the law codes are parts of these different sources. So, um, now, again, we, like I still haven't gotten to like J, E, P, and D, right? Like, I, so I'll, I'll just say J, E, P, and D are the, I'm just to get this out of the way, they're the names, like the little sigla, the little names that we give to the four sources of the Pentateuch. It doesn't matter why we call them that for the most part. Some of them are easy. D is the source that shows up in Deuteronomy, like I suggested. And P is the source in Leviticus that cares about the priests, right? That's why we call it P. Um, and, and J and E are the other, other ones. And I'm not even going to get into why they're called that because it's too complicated. Um, but... So when we refer to J, E, P, and D, what we're referring to are the sources, right? These source documents that make up the, the Pentateuchal text. So the laws of Exodus 21 to 23 belong to the E source, right? They're part of E's story, right? E is going along telling a story of where, you know, where the Israelites are, the Israelites leave Egypt and they come to this mountain in the wilderness and God says, I'm gonna make a covenant with you. And here's the laws of making that covenant. And like that's part, all part of a story. And then the laws are embedded in it. And P has its story. And the Israelites leave Egypt and they come to the mountain in the wilderness. And God's like, all right, you got to build me a, a, build me a house. We're going to call it the tabernacle. You build the house. And once you build the house, I'm going to tell you how you need to like do sacrifices and all those things. And that's the, the priestly laws, right? Uh, and they sometimes contradict the laws in uh, from E. Mostly they're just like worried about a different thing. And then, you know, like the story goes along and you get to Deuteronomy and Moses is like, Hey, so like what happened back then was we left Egypt and we got to the mountain in the wilderness and God gave me laws and I didn't tell them to you until now, right? Which is obviously contradictory with what we have in, in Exodus and Leviticus, where it's nothing but laws. But in Deuteronomy, Moses is like, I held on to these. Uh, I held on to these for 40 years and now I'm going to give them to you. And so the laws in Deuteronomy are specific, like to the, to the context of Deuteronomy's story, the D sources story, and have full of contradictions with both the P laws in Leviticus and the E laws in, uh, in Exodus. I so wonder the if the redactor is the one who's, who's trying to connect it by saying, well, you know, I, I forgot to give it to you back here. I wonder if the redactor included that narrative format to connect it. You know what I mean? But, uh, just something to think about. Yeah. So I, I, I don't, I don't think that's what's happening there, but I think it's worth remembering worth. I mean, the redactor is worth bringing up, right? Like, the fact is, if, if at some point we're like, as, as we are, if we say, you know, this isn't one thing, it was four things that have been smushed together or interwoven, right, uh, to create this one kind of wonky, like, uh, canonical story, like, someone did that. Yeah, like, that's um, what I'm saying. And, and like, and I will tell you that the question that I get most often, most often, um, and I talk about this stuff all the time, um, yeah. Everybody, like people generally can get on board 
um, with, you know, there's contradictions and I can take like any one of these stories, the Joshua, the Joseph story or um, the flood story or whatever, I can take a whole range of texts and be like, I, I can show you in a way that will convince you that there are in fact two stories here and people get on board with that. And then everyone goes, but why the hell would anyone ever do this to them? Like, why do we have two of these things? Why do we, why do we have four? What, why did somebody think I've got to make these four into one? And why did they do it in such a way that like, what I end up with is this like mess of a whole. Mm -hmm. um, like, what was the incentive for someone to do that? Um, and you know, Good your question. question was like, your question is about like, how did, how did, how did that mechanically happen, right? Like, how did the redactor of the text like make it work together? The answer is like, he for sure wasn't trying to, right? right? Somebody who's trying to combine the two flood stories in such a way that like it's like smooths them out does not do what we have here, right? Because what right. we have here is two totally complete flood stories where every word is preserved and they're smushed together. And like you end up with like verses back to back that are like, uh, and you know, uh, and and every all flesh that was on earth died, period. All existence on earth died. It's like you can see that somebody like took the line from one about everyone dying in the line from one, like didn't try to make them into one sentence. It was just like, I'm just gonna, like keep it all and just smush it together. Um, and so, you know, why? Why did someone do this? Because like, um, uh, I don't know why. Like I can think of a million reasons why. And, and this is, you know, you said in the introduction, I don't talk about like when to date these things. We can have that, <laughs> conversation. We can have that conversation a little bit. But like more than not trying to date the texts, I'm really like, we can imagine a, a hundred reasons why somebody would do it this way, but like coming up with a convincing reason for why it happened isn't necessary to observing that it happened. Right. Right. Like the literary evidence, right. Of the flood story or any of it is like, um, like it's, it's, it's there in the text for us. And no matter what we think about the why or, or, or the when, like that doesn't change. Right. So like my big thing is like, see it in the text and then maybe we can find, then maybe we could figure out like a rationale for it or a time for it or a place for it. And there are good options there, mm -hmm. but they're not necessary for us to like accept what we're seeing with our own eyes in the, in the text itself. Thank you for that. I want to say right now, I do not mean any disrespect pulling this stuff on the screen. I just don't want to miss people's questions. And so yeah. if they but pop up, finish your train of thought, of course, and then we'll try to get to the questions. But also there's 209 people on right now and we have 113 likes. We're like all barely scratching 50% on the likes. And uh, I'm better than that, people. Come yeah, on. Yeah, come on, man. You know, hit the like button. Okay. Anyway, uh, thank you for that super chat, Mike. And thanks everybody. So far, I'm going to be scrolling down and hitting your questions for super chats, uh, to get Dr. Baden to give his thoughts on it. And so I really appreciate it. This is super educational, by the way, Mike Ainsworth, $10. Thank you. What does Dr. Baden think of Richard Elliott Friedman's idea that instead of being a total myth, the exodus happened, but involved only a small group who became the Levites. Right. So, I mean, this goes to something of um, of what I was talking about when I was talking about Moses, right? Like, do I think there was a guy named Moses? Probably. Do I think that the biblical story about Moses is, is like historically true? Not really. Same thing, like expand it for the Exodus. Uh, do I think the biblical story of the Exodus happened like it's described in the Bible? No, in part because there's like four of them. Um, so which one am I going to choose? Uh, but also, you know, uh, like there's just no, right? There's We don't have good archaeological evidence for any of it. Um, mm. But interesting. I do agree, right? Uh, you know, Dick Friedman is like was is the reason that I'm in this field at all. Um, uh, you know, uh, so uh, I have a lot of respect for him. Um, the notion then that the, you know, in the same way that like someone named Moses may be the kernel behind the like underneath the uh, the the broader biblical stories. Um, like we know that Semitic peoples were enslaved in Egypt and we know that some slaves left Egypt and ran away up towards Canaan. Um, like those are, those are things that we know from Egyptian evidence, right? We're not, not even from the Bible. Um, so I am, I'm pretty easily convinced that at the core, at right, the kernel of the Exodus myth that we have in the Bible is probably one or more small groups stories 
of fleeing Egypt and crossing the wilderness and coming into and coming into Canaan and becoming part of the the, like the Israelite uh, culture and society. I don't think that I agree with uh, with Friedman about the Levites being involved in that. Um, but that's you know uh, again this is pretty nitpicky stuff. Uh, yeah. But like, the the core idea there, I think I think I do agree with, which is um, the Exodus the, the biblical Exodus story is not historically true. Again, the biblical Exodus stories can't all be historically true simultaneously, and I think none of them is. But I think that there is absolutely a historical reality under there that um, that sort of generated uh, the, the the broader myth. I could like so rabbit trail with you on these conversations, but I'm going to get people's questions rather than because there's so many cool ideas we could throw up. I was going to bring up Hyksos and I wonder if just like they Marduk and stuff uh, with borrowing a, a birth narrative, I wonder if a mythologized narrative of an Exodus is maybe from an Hyksos expulsion from Egypt. I don't know, but I, I don't want to go there. I just want to throw that out there to tease people and say, maybe we can get you back on sometime and like just throw things around together. I don't know. Dragons yeah. of Genesis. Go subscribe to his channel, Jason folks. Thanks for the super chat, my friend. Awesome friend of mine. All the drowning people in Noah's flood had one thing in common. They didn't hit that like button. I mean, that's true. You know, it's, it's only, that's only in one of the two flood stories though, is the thing. So I don't know. <laughs> if it's it in the end. Dude, an expert, take it from an expert. Okay. Cause he knows what he's talking about. Anna twink. Thank you so much for my friend. Where did song of Solomon originate? And it's pornographic as I think. It's as not, it is it's, it's not so it's not so much a pen and two question but since you since, <laughs> since you ponied up the pounds um uh, I'll, I'll i'll give you the, the 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 one sentence answer uh song of solomon uh, is a, probably a it was probably originally some sort of like uh what we would call secular uh that didn't really it wasn't really a category then but it's basically ancient israel that love poetry um like it's not, a, it was not originally a metaphor for God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church. And in that sense, it was, it was love poetry. And yes, it is just as pornographic as you think it is. I, I love it though. I love it. I thought you had to be like 30 years old to read it in, uh, in Jewish uh, traditions or something. <laughs> uh, Neophyte one. Thank you for the, uh, super chat here. Dear Baden, Dr. Baden read, read and love your book. Uh, can you offer speculation on which document represents the oldest material relative to the others? Cheers. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good question because, uh, this is one of these things that scholars have been working on thinking about for about as, about as long as we've had the theory, right? Um, once you see that there's four four documents, so like, what's the evolution there, right? Um, right. And and I'll tell you, like the the most common argument is that J is the earliest and P is the latest, and. And I'll tell you why people think that. You're not going to like the answer. The reason people think that is because this argument, the whole thing was really like developed mostly like primarily 19th century Protestant Germans. Um, like second half of the 19th century is when this really like exploded uh, onto the scene. Um, and for them, they looked at what we call the P document, which is which is Leviticus, right? It's all the like ritual stuff and all the like, you know, sacrifice and ritual and priests and all that. And they looked at it and they were like, they squinted and they were like, it's just Catholicism, right? Like hmm. it's, it's like priests and a ritual. And like, that's not like, that's like, that's like Judaism, Catholicism. That's like, that's like, there's like it's Protestants. It's about like, you know, it's about a, a personal interaction, a personal relationship with the deity. And it's like, like that's what's going on in J, right? Like God appears to Abraham and like they have conversations and arguments and like, uh, people express their religious feelings by, you know, spontaneously building altars and giving gifts and that sort of thing. And there's no like rules about how you give your gifts and atoning for sin. And like, that's all, that must all be later because like, that's the, that's the ancient Israelite religion degenerating the same way that Christianity in their mind degenerated from Jesus into the C Catholic church uh, that they were, you know, they, they were unhappy with having. So once I say it that way, you, you understand, right? There's a, there's a, like, um, there's a bias against the priestly uh, material the like all the ritual sacrifice stuff in Leviticus, right? That it, it can't, that can't be early, right? Because earlier means more authentic and true, yeah. uh, you see, um, <laughs> right? which, which is also, which is also a Protestant, I think largely a Protestant uh, perspective. Um, 
but uh, but in fact, right? There's no, there's nothing literarily in the text itself to distinguish on timing between J and P, right? Uh, D, I can tell you, is a little later than J and E. I don't need to go into the details, but D seems to be familiar with J and E and like knows that they exist and like refers to them. But like P and J, which are often the ones on the like the far sides of the spectrum, are um, right. There's nothing. There's nothing that says one is earlier and one is later. And so what we have to remember is, it's not that we don't want to think about this as like which one was the first one to say the thing and then everyone else got it from them, right? Uh, these these source documents weren't like mini Bibles for ancient Israel, right? They were just like texts that existed in ancient Israel. They probably existed simultaneously, um, the way that like we have multiple histories of the U.S. like floating around in our bookstores right now. Um, uh, which one? Which one came first? It almost doesn't even matter which one came first. Like in terms of which one was written first, they're all reflecting traditions about Israel that go back before them, right? So like, it's not like one of them invented Moses. Right, everybody knew about Moses. So, like Moses has an idea, and a lot of the stories about Moses probably pre-exist any of our written sources. Um, so we have, like, we really like putting things in order, right? Like, it's kind of a human like tendency. We like to put things in order right. and, see, and see development, and like, you know, we like Darwinism in various in various forms. Uh, but it's not like it's not so easy with the, with the, with the biblical sources. Um, this leads into an interesting question by my friend here, Dustin Ellerby. And thank you for the super chat, my friend, because, um, the documentary hypothesis poses a later co compositional development of all these sources, if you will. I mean, obviously a redactor came together and put this together and there seems to be this uh, situation that happens in the prophets and so the question is, does Dr. Baden think these documents are religi uh, religious, political, if you will, apologetics between the northern and southern territories? So you have the Samaritans, you have Judeans, and wondering if some of these sources, I guess, are more favored from certain territories of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. What, do you have a, an opinion on this or something? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... There's again long-standing uh, sort of scholarly position that uh, essentially J is the southern right Judahite uh, rendition of Israel's early history, and that E is the northern Israelite uh, rendition of of the history. Some of the reasons to think that are um, are pretty obscure, uh, you know. So E has some traditions and some uh, ideas that seem to align with uh, the, the the northern prophets that we have uh, Amos uh, and Hosea for example right like um, so when we have prophets who we who say are said to come from the from the northern kingdom um, and they sort of have some of the same perspectives and same language as as e that, okay maybe um, that's you know that's that's a possible uh, cue um, there are you know it's it is the, in the E story that we have the story of the golden calf, right? Which most scholars, uh, I think, correctly read as uh, sort of a polemical attack on these uh, these, sin these sanctuaries up in up in the northern kingdom, uh, where they had golden calves in the sanctuaries. Hmm. Um, uh, and there's and there's some reason to read J as coming from a sort of monarchic setting, like a royal court sort of history. Um, which would situate it more toward the south, right? Where uh, you know, with David being from from Judah and all, it's possible. What um, about Mount Gerizim? Doesn't that play a role somewhere in the the Pentateuch? I mean, Mount, Ger Mount, Mount Gerizim plays a role in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, okay. In like where, uh, and so that's that's sort of a later development in the history of the text, actually, and a really interesting one. Um, I, what I would say is this. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to assume that these sources are more than reasonable. We have to assume that these sources come from particular social settings, geographical um, or, you know, professional, like prophets, priests, royal scribes. Um, I don't know that we can always pin them down, but for sure there's all kinds of international and inner Israelite sort of geopolitics, as you were, that are floating around, um, in, in these texts, in the, in the back stories, in the, the front stories, I don't know. Um, <laughs> like there's a, uh, 
they're, they're usually not very explicit because right, again, these, these, um, these texts are all really good about remembering that they're telling stories about Israel before there was an Israel, right? Before it was in the land, right? The Pentateuch doesn't like end still not in Canaan. So they like, they don't break character a lot and, and like clearly point to something in their own, like in the history of the time when they were Anachronisms, written. Anachronisms, they right. call. There's, yeah. not, there's not a lot. They're all really v pretty good at, at, at keeping straight. There's no mention of a temple in any of the sources, even though there's a temple when any of them was written. Right? Like they were all written in a time when there's a temple, but like they're all, you know, they all like sort of like allude to it, right? Deuteronomy talks about like, eventually you'll worship in the place where God chooses, right? Doesn't say the temple, right? Doesn't say Jerusalem, but like alludes to, because he's very conscious of this his narrative setting, which makes it a little bit harder to see some of those geopolitical things. Go to this one. Awesome. Anna Twink, thank you for another super chat. Hit that like button, everybody. We've got 233 people watching right now. we got 147 likes. Let's get those likes up, please. YouTube loves that. That We'll keep growing. We keep doing this stuff. We'll have awesome people like Dr. Joel Baden join us and keep educating us. So how do Orthodox Jews deal with these contradictions? Is that why the Talmud was written or the Mishnah, please? That's a good question, actually. It is a good question. Um, so here's the thing. Um, Orthodox Jews, okay, so traditional Judaism has a couple of ways of dealing with this. Um, one is, you know, a whole set of, um, uh, a whole set of uh, in interpretations that are meant to bridge gaps and resolve contradictions, right? So remember that like the rabbis of the, um, you know, the first half of the first millennium or the first millennium uh, at CE, uh, were the best readers of the biblical text there have ever been. And every any contradiction that we see today, they saw 10 more, right? Like they saw every wow. tiny little detail. They knew everything, right? They saw every problem. For us, we're like, oh, it's just a different, it's like a, that's just word choice. That's like not even a big deal. And they were like, no, it's meaningful. And like they built a thing out of it. Um, so there's a huge interpretive uh, tradition. The Talmud and the Mishnah are, um, are part of it though they deal almost exclusively not with the stories and those problems, but with the laws. Um, uh, those are both legal legal commentaries. Um, but there's you know uh, what we call the midrash, which is this like huge body of uh, interpretive material that deals with mostly with the with the the narrative stuff. And so they're working all of this out. Um, so there's a system in place for traditional Judaism like that that already deals with this sort of thing. The interesting thing about traditional Judaism is um, essentially, traditional Judaism, even while upholding a sense of historicity in the text, uh, at the at the same time, uh, basically is okay with like multiple possibilities at once, right? Uh, so whereas, and I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll speak in really broad sort of generalizations here, but whereas, uh, and I, I encounter this all the time when I teach this to my like introductory community <laughs> school, right? Like. The notion of their of, of the Bible telling one story or revealing one truth, or like or like the truth, um, is totally foreign to to Judaism, right? Uh, even when Judaism is arguing over like like laws, like practical interpretations of like how do we do this law, right? The the way it's done is Rabbi so and so says X, and Rabbi so and so other one says Y, and then. Uh, Okay, so let's figure out why Rabbi X says this. Okay, do we understand that? Yes. Now, why does Rabbi Y think the other thing? Do we understand that? Yes. Okay, next question. And like, there never comes to the point where they're rarely going to come to the point where they're like, and this one had it right. Right? Like, the idea isn't for for there to be right or wrong. It's that's okay. That's okay too. Um, and so, even when even when traditional Jewish texts are taking like narrative contradictions and trying to fill in the gaps or figure out like what's you know like tell story, like expand the stories to make them work. One rabbi will expand it one way and another rabbi will expand it another way. And they're like, awesome, two answers, right? Which is to say like, it, it's a sort of acceptance of multiple perspectives and multiple arguments as being equally valid simultaneously is baked into Judaism as an interpretive um, practice. And so, um, so the, the what bothers Orthodox Jews mostly, I would say, is the notion that Moses didn't write it, or that it is somehow problematic and needs to be solved, hmm. right? Um, for within the Jewish context, these aren't problems to be solved; they're like 
things in the text to be explored. Um, right. And so uh, that's, no, I that's, think that's interesting. And that, I think that keeps them from burning people at the stake who take a different position. So thank right. you. <laughs> right. Also, if, I wanted to make mention for, for, if you want heresy, you need to have orthodoxy, like the, like not the orthodox Judaism, but like the concept and uh, Judaism is pretty good at avoiding that as a thing. I love that. That's, that's something I can respect, even though I think they're just caught up in a system of thought, they must look at it this way and stuff. And I get it. Um, you mentioned something in your book. I want to bring up Ben's question here, but you, you mentioned something really quick. I just want to make comment. There's some interesting stuff in his book. You got to get it. Uh, this is the development of the Pentateuch that he wrote, he talks about interesting historical people who have a say on this. He talks about John Calvin and Martin Luther, what their thoughts are about the contradiction, for example, in the Joseph story, who who sold him into slavery, who, you know, all that. Also mentioning people like Philo, Josephus, like they don't, they pick one narrative. They're, they're clever. It's like they knew this issue. So they just picked, oh, it was the, um, the uh, Ishmaelites. And they ran, they ran with that narrative and cut out the contradictory uh, situation in that particular narrative. I don't know all the narratives. I just was reading your book. I want to make that comment. Got to get the book. So Ben, uh, thank you for the super chat. Um, El Shaddai. We talked about this at the beginning of this uh, before we even hit record. I was like, uh, what happened here in Genesis 43, 14? Is that weird? Or do I have unreasonable expectations about J and P staying in their lanes with divine names? So Ben is definitely our like uh, super detailed, specific question guy, which is great. Yeah. Um, so let me open this up like a tiny bit before coming back to the uh uh, to, the, to the question itself, right? One of the big things that comes up all the time in the question of the composition of the Pentateuch and the sources is um, is the divine names, right? Like it's it's one of the better known, if not the best known, like um, symptom, uh, as as it were, of of, the, of there being multiple um, uh, of the disease of multiple sources. So uh, you know, the, it is the it is the claim of the J source that from basically like the very beginning of time. People were using God's proper name um, uh, to like in worship and just generally, right? Like, right. It, like everybody knew it. Like from from you know uh, from Abraham's like uh, not Abraham from like uh, Adam's grandkid on. Like everyone, like fourth generation on, everyone knew this stuff. Um, and it's the perspective of the E source that uh, that. God tells Moses his proper name in Exodus three as kind of like a password or like to show the Israelites that he actually like did speak to God. Right. And that's where you get the famous line, right? Like I am who I am. Right. Um, uh, uh, anyway, that's, that's the, that's the E story and P's claim and P's really specific about this in Exodus six, P says, I appeared to the patriarchs, to your ancestors as El Shaddai, but that's not my real name. Right. Like, and then tells him, and then tells him his real name. Uh, and then, you know, that's what they use from then on. So P is very clear, right? Like I, I appear to them as El Shaddai. And if you go back and look in Genesis, sure enough, right? Like Genesis 17, one, where God appears to Abraham for the first time in the, in the, in the priestly story, I am El Shaddai. And later on, Jacob says, uh, Jacob says to his sons on his deathbed, right? El Shaddai appeared to me at this time. So like it's, P is good. It's consistent, right? Like the patriarchs in P, nobody in Genesis and P for the most part, I think, Nobody in Genesis in P refers to God by God's actual name. They all refer to him as El Shaddai and he's introduced to them as El Shaddai. Um, El Shaddai is like, it's a kind of a weird name, right? It's the one that's translated God Almighty um, uh, in, uh, in in most English Bibles. Uh, whatever, it's, it's just like, it's another one of the God names, right? There's a bunch of them. El, Elohim, El Shaddai, right? Like God of the fathers, God in the fear of Isaac. There's a whole bunch of ways to refer, refer to God. Jesus, that one doesn't come up in the... Uh, in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, but the, um, but so the, the question uh, that, uh, uh, the question that Ben asked is, okay, well, if El Shaddai is like what P thinks God was known as back in Genesis, then how is it, or why is it that in Genesis 43, which is part of the Joseph story, um, where in, in a section that we generally attribute not to P, uh, but to J, uh, um, it's uh, sorry, it's not 43, right? it's, it's 49, right? So this is 49, um, uh, where that comes. Uh, and, and it's, you know, and El Shaddai gets, um, uh, I don't know if it's 49. Anyway, it's in there, right? Uh, I shouldn't argue with the person who asked the question. Uh, there's reference to, uh, right? There's a, a, a reference to, to El Shaddai. I think it is in 49. Um, in, in what, what we think is a J text. 
And so I'm, I'm going to say, like, and this is, this is a useful opportunity to make the point that when we say that a word or a phrase is like associated with one of the given sources, right? El Shaddai is P's word for God in Genesis. That doesn't mean no one else knew the name or could ever use it, right? And, uh, you know, so when, when you see people making arguments about, you know, how we see the sources in the Pentateuch and they're like, oh, well, I know it because this word belongs to this source and mm -hmm. this word belongs to this source. Um, like, that's a weird, like they all spoke Hebrew, right? Like, it's not the case that just because one source uses a word consistently or in some consistent manner, no one else could, like they laid claim to it and no one else could possibly use it. They were all perfectly good Hebrew speakers. They all knew, they were all out of the same culture. Um, so it's not about like exclusivity of use of names or styles or, um, or phrases or whatever, but you know, you could still, for example, like uh, you could probably identify some of uh, your favorite authors by their language, right? Like they use certain phrases a lot. Um, uh, right? Like the example I use all the time of this is Harold Bloom, this wonderful, like, uh, you know, uh, literary critic from Yale, uh, who's written on, on, who's written on, on the book of, on, on the J source, among other things. Um, uh, he uses the word uncanny, like, a million times in his writing. Like you could give me a piece of literary criticism and if you use the word uncanny enough, I'd be like, I bet this is Harold Bloom. Yeah. But I've used the word uncanny in my writing, like maybe once, yeah. right? It doesn't mean that Harold, <laughs> Bloom, Harold Bloom didn't write that sentence for me, right? Like it's just, it's about, uh, so it's okay for P to say El, Shaddai, say El Shaddai and make a big deal out of it. And it's okay for someone else to say El Shaddai and not make a big deal out of it. That doesn't, that doesn't ruin anything for us. I guess the question would follow is, do they use El Shaddai later as well as a, is it a name referred to God later beyond that narrative uh, situation? Yeah, you find El Shaddai in the Psalms, right? Like it's okay. a, it's a, it's a totally, it was a totally known way cool. to refer to God. Anna Twinks, twinking at us, winking at us. Thank you for the five. I appreciate it. Is Yahweh possibly Bell? And this was something that was asked on your previous <laughs> show. I like the way it's phrased. Is, ya is Yahweh Bell? <laughs> Come on, you know, being the storm God and the son of God, L. So this gets into not only the whole Bell Canaanite pantheon uh, to mention some of that. Uh, yeah, I'll let you have fun. Yeah. With that. <laughs> um, so what's behind this question is, uh, is a recognition that, like the Canaanite, the Canaanite culture that was like right next to uh, that of Israel and probably out of which Israel originally emerged um, had a, right, this, this whole pantheon of the deities, right? El and Baal or Baal and like Asherah, who was like the female consort to, to Baal. Um, and, you know, uh, whatever, there's a few others. Um, those are kind of the big ones. And um, obviously the Bible is full of like, like explicit railing against worshiping Baal or Baal, right? Um, you got the whole story about Elijah and like the prophets of Baal in, uh, um, in the book of Kings. And like, it's, uh, this is like a ton of it, right? Like they're super obsessed with the people not worshiping Baal. So one of the things that we should uh, recognize here, and this is less to do with the compass of the Pentateuch and more to do with, um, you know, the Bible more generally or ancient Israel more generally is that, right? Uh, what Israel did is they said, here's our God, Yahweh. Uh, and our God is going to, because we don't want people to worship the other gods that exist, um, like in surrounding cultures, we're going to give Yahweh all the characteristics of those gods. So Baal was the storm god, right? Like, which makes sense, right? Canaan, like the Canaanites lived on the coast and the storms coming in off the sea. And Israel lived in like the highlands, right? The mountains, like where Jerusalem is, right? Like towards, over toward the Dead Sea. Did they like they get storms there occasionally, but not like the ones in the coast? But Yahweh becomes a storm god, right? Why? Because Baal was a storm god, and like, like we can't leave that to, right? Like, like we can't leave that area. Yahweh is a fertility god too, hmm. right? but like for sure that wasn't like that. That's someone else. Like in in the Canaanite pantheon, that would have been someone else's domain. Um, so Yahweh takes on characteristics of deities from. Uh, from mostly the Canaanite deities from, from all around. Yahweh isn't Baal, right? Like not the same deity, especially because, uh, and this not, not to get like way out of our lane, but especially because uh, the, for the most part in, in the, certainly in the sources of the Pentateuch, 
they didn't dispute the fact that Bal existed, right? They knew Bal existed. They knew that they knew that Bal existed in Canaan, and Kamosh was the national god of the Moabites, and uh, or the I always get it mixed up. Uh, yeah, and, and Milcom was the national god of the Ammonites, and they knew about um, like they knew they every, everybody knew everyone else's gods, right? Like um, in the same way that like you know the name of the governor of the state next to yours, right? Like they knew like okay, the Canaanites have Baal and we have Yahweh. And that's that's cool. And like the Moabites have Kamosh and, and we have Yahweh. And like, uh, so it wasn't about like, which one is real. It was about like, no, we, we're we Yahweh worshipers and they're Baal worshipers. And the problem isn't that other people worship Baal. The problem is when Israelites worship Baal. Mm -hmm. So Yahweh isn't Baal because there's both, right? Yahweh and Baal both exist. That was a long answer. This is interesting because it makes me wonder where Yahweh comes from. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, is this a prior to Israel God that is now being lifted and brought in? And I guess I'm going to ask this question because, it, look, we just touched on that kind of, but not the whole origins of Yahweh. My question, and that might be something we don't for sure know its origins completely. Um, sure Go ahead. <laughs> and that's why I love scholarship because scholarship does not say we know, and this is the truth and I'm right. And like, I I'm more engaging with people who are like, you know, open-minded, open discussions. It could be, could not be love that kind of stuff about scholarship. Um, one of the questions I had, and I'd written this down is I had interviewed Dr. Michael Heiser. Now he's a Christian apologist, but he's a smart one. He's, he's a, uh, comparative, like there's not really much comparison in terms of, uh, his level of, uh, scholarship and, and research. And he argued where some scholars say polytheism was a thing and then the redactors or sources are trying to edit out the polytheism that's in the Bible. He says, no, no, no. It's always henotheism. It's always not absolute monotheism, but it was henotheism where there's God most supreme and he's the only one that Israel should worship, but they do recognize all the other gods. They don't take away their power. In fact, sometimes they're respectful of them like look respect their gods but don't worship them mm -hmm. and so is it true that the entire pentateuch that we have all the sources and stuff were not actually polytheistic and then edited or at one point they were polytheistic and then moved into hyper monotheism i guess i'd call it right so uh all of the, all of our sources in the pentateuch and i'm going to go out further and say all pre-exilic biblical writing generally, including prophets and Psalms and everything, like every, anything that we can and like potentially or uh, uh, with, with some justification date to, you know, before the sixth century, the, before the fifth century um, even, uh, none of them are monotheistic, right? Monotheism, the, the, the first time we get monotheism in the Bible is in second Isaiah, right? The second half of the book of Isaiah. Um, uh, and I don't, and like, that's the first time it appears. It doesn't mean that's like suddenly the entire nation was like, Oh man, I guess it's monotheism now. Right? Like that's when somebody said, I think monotheism. Um, so before that, uh, it's not monotheism. The, I'm going to make a distinction between the biblical texts okay. and, and ancient Israel, right? The biblical texts are henotheistic or monolatrous, right? Like it's not about, um, it's not about the question of whether there are multiple gods, there for sure were, but we worship one, right? And that I think is, um, I don't think the texts were ever anything other than that. I don't think that the, I don't think that, um, and I think that uh, my sense is that for the most part, most of Israel in like historical reality would, would say the same, right? Like our national deity is Yahweh, like the national deity of the right? Ammonites is Milcom. And like, that's the, and like, when you pick up the Bible, how much of it is like people yelling, just, just worship this one, like, like stop worshiping other gods, right? Just worship this God, right? When you say, don't worship other gods, just worship Yahweh. What you're saying is there's other gods out there that you could be worshiping and seem to be, stop that, right? You owe your allegiance to this one. Right? And that's pervasive, right? Pervasive Pentateuch, prophets everywhere. Um, that's the, that's the main claim. It's not monotheistic. It is henotheistic. I don't think that there was anything. I don't think this, that the texts have been edited to make them uh, henotheistic from an original polytheist. I don't think there's any evidence for that at all. What I would say, though, is 
depending on how you define polytheism, right? My, it's it's clear, I think, both from some of the biblical like screeds against it and from archaeology, that plenty of people living in Israel had, you know, whether it was like an ancestral cult, right? Like they worshiped deceased ancestors or a fertility cult where they worship maybe, or, you know, they would lapse and they would occasionally worship, you know, both Yahweh and Baal or, right? Like, I don't know that I would call that polytheism as opposed to henotheism, right? Like, I think they would still recognize that Yahweh is our national deity and is supreme things. Right. I mean, supreme within our nation. Um, I don't know, and probably better than the other gods, but like not like, but not like, like existentially different, right? Um, just better. Uh, but I think, so I think, you know, it's, it can still be essentially henotheism, even if you think Yahweh is your national deity and you also like have a little cult shrine to someone in your house on the side, right? You're not, in other words, you're not, you're not, in, you're, all of it envisions a world populated by multiple gods, right? Both polytheism and henotheism. But, you know, real, when I think of real polytheism, right? I think of like a divine, like there's a, a like a whole body of divine divine beings who sort of like you know like in in Greece or Mesopotamia, right? Where um, like they have like these stories about them interacting, like they're on they're all on some equal level, and I don't think that's what's going on in, in Israel. I was thinking of um, the Genesis situation where we used to think the Trinity was secretly in Genesis one twenty seven. Let us make man in our image. You know, <laughs> as Christians, we think that's the Trinity, but. Uh, I, uh, and I think Dr. Heiser, of course, doesn't take that. But I thought it was interesting just to bring that up. Like, they're borrowing this from Mesopotamia. Was Mesopotamia polytheistic? Yeah, so Mesopotamia was polytheistic, but that's not what that us is doing there. Okay. Okay. Like, uh, you know, th and that thing shows up, that us shows up occasionally. It shows up both in Genesis 1 and it shows up in, uh, it shows up in Genesis uh, uh, 3, I think. Anyway, there's, um, it certainly shows up in Genesis 11 or Tower of Babel. Let us go down and see what's going on down there. Um you know, we don't need to really get into the like, uh, get into the the details of what's going on there. I don't think that's, I don't think that's certainly not the Trinity, nor do I think it's a remnant of polytheism um, in the in the sense that we mean it. Uh, I think everybody would have told you that there was a divine, that it was Yahweh was up there in heaven or something with a divine council. That's right. important. There, yeah. were, there are other divine beings out there. Like there are other divine beings, even, even what we think of as like super, like reasonably monotheistic things like, I, whatever, like the vision of Isaiah, right? When Isaiah goes up, right? Uh, and what does he encounter? He he sees God sitting on the throne with like wearing some nice clothes. And like all around him are like, all around him are these other beings up there that talk, right? They say they're all going, holy, 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 right? Yeah. Um, what do you think those are, right? Those those aren't normal, like those are divine beings. They're, that's That's, I think what's imagined when we get that like, let us do a thing. So um, the council, the... Or, or, or counsel or like whatever, when God goes to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Like the first thing he does is he and a couple of his like divine being friends come down and visit Abraham, right? And then God chats with Abraham while the two like remaining divine being like pals, like go down to Sodom and like get in trouble there, right? Who are those two things, right? Like they're divine manifest, they're manifestations of Yahweh somehow, but they have individual like beings, they're separable. like. That's not polytheism and it's not the Trinity. Uh, okay. It's like, it's just like, it's just like, we need to allow the ancient Israel and the Bible to have a more expansive understanding of, of God and uh, just generally almost everything than we do, right? Like we can't be like, we think there's only one God or a Trinity or whatever. So like, how do I make sense of this book in light of that? That's not how that works, right? Like, we need to make sense of, of uh, right, ourselves in light of it, right? Not the other way around. Remind me Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot real quick. Uh, just to remind me when, when we get done with this question, Thomas Paine says, do most more uh, oral tradition, uh, oral religions eventually get spliced together like the Old Testament? Hit that like button. we got 251 people watching. Hit the like button, please. Thank you. Okay, so the 50 people who showed up since we started, I'm going to go back to the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, do, do most oral religions eventually get spliced together like the OT? You know, I don't know how to, I, I wouldn't even do it in terms of like, um, you don't even have to think of it in terms of religion. Uh, and I'm not sure that I have like at my fingertips really great examples of this. Um, and, and anyway, but most oral traditions, like 
agglomerate, right? Um, uh, it's simply like as as writing develops, right? Like there's all this content out there, right? We can think of this in lots of ways, right? Like anthology, even anthologies of like, you know, Appalachian folk songs, right? Like that's oral tradition that now that that has now been anthologized into like a, an album or a, or a book or um, you know the Grimm brothers and their and their sort of folklore, um, right? We think of as these like collections, you know, they're these collections of, like they went around and, and listened um, and recorded and brought stuff together and. Um, it, it, there's a, maybe a difference between anthologizing and, in, and interweaving and splicing, but it's the instinct I think is the same. Interesting. Thank you. Sodom and Gomorrah, I was told to remind you. Yes. Okay. Um, I was told this and maybe you can elaborate. Dr. Robert Price mentioned that, you know how Lot thought he was the last guy on planet earth or his daughters did. At least that's what it mentions. That there's no one else that we can't populate. We got to sleep with dad. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be funny about the story. We could be funny about the story in modern sense of what we live in today in our culture and be like, ha ha, that's so ridiculous and stupid. Got it. This is an old ancient story, but fire destruction. Um, was this an end of the world scenario for him the same way an end of the world flood narrative? Is this a strange source of an end, so to speak, kind of like an end with the flood? Because they they thought this was it. Why didn't they just cross the valley and go sleep with Abraham's descendants? You know, like is this a? I don't know. Do you get what I'm trying to get at? Like, I, I, I think so. Um, I'm not trying to be funny either. I mean, it is kind of like ugh, you could go there and go, oh, this is nasty, you know. But like, no, uh, so uh, it's, interesting. it's an interesting question. So I th I think one of the things to remember here. Um, here's my take on this. The the situation we have here is the Sodom and Gomorrah story. We don't have to get into like the whole thing, uh, though it's plenty interesting. Um, but it's really, it's like a, one big etiology, right? Etiology, right? Like a story that explains a thing. And what it's an etiology for is why the region of the Dead Sea looks like that, right? Why is it that like, if I go 25 kilometers to the east, I'm in like rolling, <laughs> rolling hills and trees, truly, right? Like I'm in like right. rolling hills and trees, but you know, uh, but over here, 25 miles, uh, 20, 25 kilometers, 20, 25 to the west to get to the good stuff, 25 to the east to get to the Dead Sea. Like, how is it that I go from like these, this wonderful, like, you know, this, these valleys and these mountains with these trees, and then I get 25 miles to the east and it's like the moon, right? Mm. Like, the story exists to explain why, why does it look like that there? Okay. Um, and, and, right, and the answer is God reigned, fire and brimstone down and like, you know, it was punishment, but like the explanation is divine destruction, right? And why is it so salty? Oh, that's Lot's wife, right? She, she, she looked back. Um, but okay, they didn't have like the, like the scientific explanation for the saltiness of that, of that region. So like, that's part of the story too, but it's explaining, why does it look like that? Now, if we then take that and like transfer it into the world of the story, we have to imagine what they, what the characters in the story thought was, our world here in this area used to look like it looks 25 miles to the west, right? It used to be nice here. It used to be like uh, verdant and green and like, uh, you know, it, it was a nice place to live. It must have been, right? Lot chose to live there over living where Abraham is, right? So Lot was like, that place looks nice. It must have looked nice. And now they, you know, they, they like have run away from destruction. They like look out their door or cave or whatever. And it looks like that, right? You might not, you might assume that like the world has come to an end. Um, uh, why didn't they go to the West to like, have you ever tried walking through? Like you can walk, you can walk the hills of like, of, uh, you know, Judah or, you know, um, uh, you know, like the, you can walk the Judean Hills and like, you're, you're perfectly fine. You try to walk for like 10 minutes in the Dead Sea region, you're going to die. Like that's uh, an exaggeration, but you, yeah. I mean, you understand what I'm saying. It's like, it is not a livable landscape. Um, and the idea of like, oh, let's just trek and see how far we can get before we run into people. Maybe there's people that like survived this. Uh, it's a little more geographically complicated than like. Um, so yeah. to put it in really simple terms, this is a mythology about the region. Oh this yeah. A, okay. Yeah. Interesting. 
That's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. No, it's, 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 ab it's absolutely it's it's a story. It's a story that like is meant to explore the people who like don't live there. I think particularly like yeah, it's like it's crazy. It's it's not unlike, and I'm making up here. It's not unlike somebody coming across the Grand Canyon and being like, oh, like the deities must have like you know like swung a giant axe, like. They were. They must have been angry at the people who lived here and swung a giant axe and like you know. And now we've got this thing where those people were destroyed. Like, um, it's the same. It's the same idea. Or lightning struck the ground and yeah, whatever something yeah. there. Interesting, interesting. So um, that that begs the question. You mentioned Moses and you thought, well, there probably was a guy. Uh, was there a guy when it comes to Abraham? Because there's a lot of people that think there wasn't a guy necessarily, but. If we grant Moses, what do we yeah. do with Abraham? Um, same thing, slightly less for Abraham. Um, Moses got a story. Like there's like Moses is, is, it's not that Abraham doesn't have a story too, but Moses has like a pretty clear role. Moses is the dude who took Israel out of Egypt. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, are all like they're just ancestors, right? There's literally nothing that they do in the story that's necessary except have except have the next, like give birth to the next one in line, right? Abraham, God could have said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I need you to have a kid. And then like the story would have been, and like he could have sat there for the next 50 years and like had a kid and the story would have been exactly the same in, in the way it plays out. So all these traditions about Abraham, um, all these stories about Abraham uh, are like nice traditions, but they're not like, like endemic to the to the story itself. Um, so, was there ever someone named Abraham? My guess is there was, uh, but only insofar as some subset of Israel's, um, uh, some set of like early Israel, um, said yes, we had an ancestor named Abraham, and maybe even and here's some stories about him that we've told. Doesn't mean those stories are true. It just right. means like you know the Abraham stories are like the George Washington chopped down the cherry tree stories, right? Like. They're nice stories that we tell about our like forerunners. They're not true. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the things that scholars have long observed about the patriarchs is that they tend to cluster, right? The Abraham stories cluster around Hebron, uh, right? Hebron. Uh, the Jacob stories cluster around Bethel. Um, the Isaac stories cluster around Beersheba. So, it's a reasonable assumption that what we're looking at here in Abraham, for example, is. Uh, you know, an early sort of tribal unit or clan who said, you know, our ancestor Abraham came here and settled here, and that's why we live here to this day, right? And I and I can show I can show you the grave site that he like you know purchased or whatever, and I can show you where our people are buried, and this is the tree where he whatever whatever, right? They're they're localized, fam probably family clan tribe oriented stories, and there was some for Abraham, and there was some for Isaac in a different place, and some for Jacob in a different place. And eventually, as Israel becomes, uh, gets a sense of itself as a nation, like all of those stories became one story, right? Now, the Abraham people and the Jacob people hooked up and they were like, well, if we're going to be one people now, our ancestors, how will we have to? So, like, I'll take, I'll take, you know, the old one, you take the younger one. Like, that really, that opens a whole, a whole other can of worms about, like, where ancient Israel comes from, but nations you know. it plays a large role on nations and that's what's interesting about it too is just figuring out who you come from so i have one more question and this question i'm gonna have to elaborate so that you you can hit every nail you can possibly because i know you got to go and we're running out of time here and we're wearing the hell out of you so <laughs> i mean this is this is amazing i really really enjoy this everyone hit that like button i'd love to have him come back of course too so uh i'll only come back if he hits the requisite number of likes that's it. Or if you don't like me, I won't come back unless you hit the like. I will only come back. Whatever it was. You want yeah, to say the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Period. Point blank. Um, so here's my question. And this is important. I'd love to get more questions down the road, but he's a human being who needs to eat, who needs to, you know, go on with his life. Um, supplementary hypothesis. Just give us a tease of what that even means and why your new hypothesis for the documentary hypothesis is better what what changed and why is what you're proposing going to solve the problem so there's <laughs> solutions and that's a big one i know so after that i'm not going to bother you i just, right. I just 
uh, at least not today. All right, so here's the, <laughs> here's, here's the deal. Um, everybody sees that the text is contradictory, right? Like the, where we started, right? The contradictions in the text, the two, even the two flood stories, right? Like the two creation stories in academia, those are all like, those are all granted, right? Contradictions are granted, and the fact that we must have multiple authors is also granted. Right? It's the only exp it's the, the the explanation for this phenomenon. What you do with that then, um, right, uh, can vary. So I don't want to suggest that what I'm putting out there in terms of there being four sources um, is like the only idea that that exists or that has ever been had on this. Um, and in fact, throughout the last 150 years or so, and especially today to a certain extent. The other major approach to this is not is again to to see the contradictions and to see the different hands, but instead of seeing them as independent entities that were right merged like this, mm -hmm. um, to think of it rather as like there was one, and then someone else like wrote a different one over it. So it's it's instead of being interwoven independent things, it's just successive layers, um, and that's the supplementary right part of supplementary hypothesis. It's like there was a base thing and then it was expanded and then it was expanded and et cetera, like, you know, sort of on, on perhaps infinitely. Um, so what I want to point out is both sort of phenomena happen in the text, right? There are absolutely places where either one of the sources has been, we can say like the P source has been expanded here, right? We, that's a, that's a, it's a thing that happens or, you know, the sources were brought together and then someone expanded, like wrote a little insertion or supplemented the now combined whole of them. There's places where that's the case too. So it's not like literally one or the other is the only way that text can happen. Uh, but the reason I think that combining independent texts rather than layering texts makes more sense. And that's all we're going for here, right? We're not going for true. Right, because until like we get some like better like a new Dead Sea Scrolls that like where I where like it has J in it, uh, this is never going to be about true. It's the reason I think it's like more convincing, which is what we're really going for here. Right. Um, more probable, more convincing. The reason I think that combining independent text is more convincing than layers, and has to has to do with simply the nature of the text we have. And again, let's go back to one of our examples from the beginning. Let's do the flood story. Okay, I first author think the flood lasted for 40 days. And so that's what I write. Now along comes second author, you, uh, Derek. Uh, Derek comes along and says, no, it didn't last 40 days. It lasts 150 days. I'm going to write a layer. I'm going to rewrite. I'm going to take that base text that exists already. And I'm going to write my own stuff into it. I think it's 150. Damn it. It's 100. And I'm going to put that in there. Now, if you had an original text and you've written a new layer into it, right? Like you've written new material into it, you've edited it, right? So you have now the second edition of that text. Uh, what you don't have anymore is the first edition, right? Like you don't have a text that says 40 days and a text that says 150 days. What you have, right, is now you have a text like we have now that says 40 and 150. So, you know, Derek, if, if you thought that by writing your 150 days into the text, you were gonna now have changed the text to say 150 days, you blew it, man. Like, it, yeah, the word 150 is in there, but 40 is still in there too. And mm -hmm. now I come along or as, as like the reader of this now layered text, and I can't tell what's a layer, which parts I'm supposed to pay attention to, which part I'm not, but like you didn't write it in in a different color, right? It's not like, like it's not like the, the 150 days is in italics to let me know. It's not like the constitution where you wrote it in as an amendment at the end so I can be like, ah, there's the earlier and the later, right? It's all one thing. And the canonical text of the flood doesn't speak in the voice of a later layer, right? Mm -hmm. It speaks in the voice of both. And how do I know that this is for sure the, true, uh, the truth? Because when you, when you ask the random person on the street, as I asked you at the beginning of this, to tell me the flood story, you say, uh, you say, well, two of every animal. That's from the P story. You say 40 days and 40 nights. Oops, that's from the J story, right? Mm -hmm. You say uh, dove, that's from the J story. You say rainbow, that's from the P story, right? Like your version, the, the, like the version we tell out of the canonical text isn't either one or the other, right? Like, so the, if it were written in layers, 
the whoever wrote the later layer like really sucked at their job because they didn't produce a text that says the thing that they wanted it to say. They produced a text that like, it turns out people are gonna read whichever part of. So, you know, again, we're not talking about definitively, but just on the, like, on the logical grounds, it makes more sense for a text that is internally contradictory this way to be the product of the combination of originally contradictory independent things because you don't just write contradictions into a text you can expand you can change you can nuance that's how that's what you do with like editing right with with writing with you know supplementing or writing the layers right uh, you would you can advance notions you can like you can skew them a little you can uh, but you can't say no not this this and make it a layer of the same text because the resulting text that says both things. That's the that's It'd the. It'd been different if he said it wasn't really forty days. They thought it was forty days, but it's one hundred and fifty days. Right. You'd have to have God say something right. like, "I would, I meant, I started at forty, but I'm pissed, and I'm going to go hundred, another hundred and ten. Right. That's how you would do it, right? Like, yeah. Um, and then we might still be able to see it, but like at least we we know for sure that it's like responding to and like is, is building on. These guys weren't Neanderthals. Like, <laughs> let me just put, they know what they're doing. They're smart. Real they're, quick. They're, they were the best. They were extraordinary writers. They were extraordinary editors. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the, anytime we find ourselves saying something like, well, back then they would only have been able to read three sentences at a time. Or like, well, you know, the, sim the simplest texts are the ones that are earliest because uh, like, that, that's ridiculous, right? Like yeah. we, we have a tendency to like denigrate the intelligence of, uh, of, of the earlier. It's nonsense. They were, you know, it's just nonsense. Constellation Pegasus. I thank you for the super chat, but I told him this was his last question because he's got to go for the day. Now, if you want to answer it, that's your choice, but I'm not pushing him because I want him to come back. And uh, this first temple Judaism existence of demons. I would love to get that question. I can even ask that of Dr. Price. Uh, he's coming over Saturday and we're going to do another live Saturday too. And I'm going to be recording him in person. So it's up to you, Joel. Uh, if you're interested in commenting on that, you can. Uh, I mean, yeah, real quickly, basically nothing, right? First temple Judaism, basically nothing. Second uh, temple is where it gets crazy. Yeah. Second, like, you know, Later stuff, it it, it goes it goes kind it goes kind of nuts, uh, and there's lots of good scholarship on 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 demons and angels and other divine beings. That um, uh, there's essen essentially nothing uh, nothing of it in the first temple period. Well, thank you for the super chat though. Anyway, and thank you for taking the time to comment on that. And thank you, Mitch Mazzaroli. I hope I'm saying that right, Mazzaroli. Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate all you guys on the super chats. Joel Baden, Professor Joel Baden, get the book. It's down in the description in the recommended books area. I actually have all of his books on Amazon that are in the uh, Myth Vision recommended books that you guys can go down there and check it out. This was the competition, uh, competition, the competition <laughs> of the JEDP, right? <laughs> no, but uh, this is a really good book. Thank you for taking the time to do this. And uh, I hope that we can get you back on with your other books. If that's something you'd be interested there's, there's, in. There's, uh, yeah, there's, there's enough out there. I got, I got plenty to say, right? We ran out of time, but not out of content. So uh, exactly. uh, you know, definitely possible. Hit the like on your way out. Share this with a friend. Leave a comment. I love you guys. And do not forget who we are. We are Myth Vision.